today's so I'll try and live. Okay, my overview. Let's go back to the beginning first of all, and I'll, I'll start from there. So the question is the debt bubble and what could it mean for Canada? And I'll give a quick overview because I, if Paul Krugman is in the room, I'd need to start at this point to have him walk out. Well, let's give it a try anyway. We're in a debt deflation, and that's something which has only ever happened before back in the Great Depression. And it was first noted, noticed as a potential phenomenon of a capitalist economy by Irving Fisher. And to my way of thinking, we'll only get out of the crisis once the debt levels back to normal levels. And normal, I mean, when there's the debt we've got is for good necessary reasons, investment and some consumption, not speculation. And that could be 15 years from now. The reason now classical economists who dominate the profession, and I'm doing my best to eradicate them, uh, I think I'm a bit like Max Planck on that, when it comes to believing whether I could convert people to believe a fallacious theory, Max was talking about physicists who actually are scientists when he wrote the comment that science progresses one funeral at a time. <laughs> uh, now, the reason they didn't see this crisis coming, they leave banks, debt and money out of their models. Now, I know when I say that to a non-economist, the reaction is, huh? You've got to be kidding. You know, they're economists. Of course they know about banks and debt and money. And I say, no, they don't. They left it out of their model, so they couldn't possibly see a crisis caused by debt, banks and money even coming. And I used to, when I tried to explain this to people, I was usually, I could think of the sniggering, you know, I was a lefty. You can't read the math. It must be in there somewhere. Well, Krugman, who does write the math, finally saved me the effort of having to assert this by making this statement in the New York Times, or his blog in the New York Times. He said he always tries to find the simplest representation possible. You ever heard of the KISS principle? Let's keep it simple, but not, but not, but not too simple. As simple as it can be, but not, not too simple, which, is, which was Einstein's idea. Make the idea as simple as possible, but no simpler. He goes beyond that point. So you have to go at me and say that I bring a lot of assumptions that, uh, I, that I don't explain why they're crucial. <clears throat> and then he says, I assert that putting in banks in the story is essential. Nobel Prize winner in economics, people. This is the next line. I'm all for including the banking sector in stories where it's relevant, but why is it so crucial to a story about debt and leverage? I rest my case. I mean, my way, if you actually try to analyze capitalism without including banks, debt, and money, it's like trying to explain how birds fly while, while assuming they don't have wings. Good luck. If anybody takes you seriously with the theory, but unfortunately, economists, we do. So they believe we can ignore what I'm going to call the red pill, and you'll see why in a moment, those know your matrix references that's obviously related to that. The red line is the ratio of private debt to GDP. Notice any similarities between now and the Great Depression. The blue line is the one that politicians and neoclassical economists obsess about and say we should be worried about. Massive levels of government debt, which are at the moment running about one third, one quarter of the level of private debt. So if you take a good look at it, look at the red pill carefully, the only time where we're seeing debt plunge in the way that it's plunging right now was the Great Depression. And the only time we saw it rising at that exponential rate before now was the Roaring Twenties. Whereas the Roaring Twenties only really lasted for about five years when you take a look at the length of time that bubble went for, ours really began right back in 1945, all the way through. And debt's been growing across that whole period almost exponentially, with a couple of exceptions where it grows super exponentially all the way through. So the stage where our debt level now is 1.7 times what it was when the Great Depression began. So anybody who's not an economist would look at that and say, there's something to be known about debt. But an economist says, oh no, we can ignore it. Well, what I'm going to tell you tonight is how why you should ignore the economists instead and follow your gut instincts about data like that. Now, of course, is Canada, that's American data. What's Canada like? Well, thanks to Jim, I managed to find some of this data. I can't see whether the data includes the financial sector's debt to the banking sector. That's me, an important part of the whole dynamic. That's account, that accounts for 120% of the private debt ratio in America. The, the total ratio to GDP is 300% at, the, at its peak, and 120% of that was borrowing by the shadow banking sector from the banks. So I don't know whether this is or is not included in the data I've got for Canada. Hopefully, 
Well, hopefully it is included because if it is, you've got a much smaller debt bubble than America. 170% of GDP. So I can't be sure whether it compares, there's, the, the data just isn't that good. America keeps excellent data and their economists do an excellent job of ignoring it. Canadians, I'm not certain whether the data include that particular component, but uh, even without it, you've got a debt bubble and it has burst. Now, why does debt, debt matter? Well, the way a conventional economist think about it is to say that banks lend from reserves, so they have to have reserves before they can lend. And what they're doing is simply connecting savers with borrowers. So they're simply sitting in between us. Matthias might be a responsible character, doesn't spend very much. I'm a profligate so-and-so. I borrow $100 off him. I can spend $100 more, but he's $100 less to spend, therefore it doesn't matter. Therefore you ignore it. That's literally the way they think about it. And again, just to remind you of Paul Krugman's statement, he's all for including banks in a story where it's relevant, but why is it relevant to debt and leverage? Well, let's quote a rampant radical, the Vice President of the City of New York Fed, in 1969, trying to stop the monetarist experiment led by Milton Friedman. And he talked about monetarism and having what he called the naive assumption. Now, that's his description. The Vice President of the Fed actually knew the, the practical ins and outs of how the Fed operated. Is that they, they have a naive assumption that the banking sector only expands loans after reserves have been put into the system. And he said, in the real world, banks extend credit, creating deposits in the process, and they look for the reserves later. So the reserves are not a control mechanism, they're a residual. And he kept on going about it, this is much more detail in his speech than just that. He said, what the reserves are based on is the level of deposits two weeks earlier. So when you, when you know what your deposits are, and you've already created additional loans that expand the deposits, then the reserves are based on what you did two weeks ago. So it's not a control mechanism, the reserves run behind. And he said, at the same time, the banks are required, that, as a central bank, it's required to make sure that banks can sever the loans with each other. So they've got no choice about the amount of reserves in there. Now, of course, I'm sure you'll all realise that with the advances in computer technology in the last 40 years since that statement was written, the time lag is no longer two weeks, it's now a month. So this is the fallacy that conventional economists like Krugman have that means that they ignore the role of debts, debt and banks and money. There's their imagination that he's a patient person cautiously saving, uh, an impatient person who's got no money at all, and what happens is a patient person lends to the impatient person. So the patient person spending power falls, the impatient person spending power goes up. In the aggregate, there's no particular change. Might be, they might have different rates at which they'll spend, but that's all you can bring it down to. And you can ignore the banks and they just sit there as an intermediary between the two parties. So that's the vision that conventional economists have of banking. The actual process is a bit more like this. An entrepreneur, or these days, unfortunately, normally a real estate speculator, approaches a bank and says, I've got a great idea. And the bank says, yep, we like that idea. Here's $100 million. And by the way, you owe us $100 million. So there's a simultaneous double entry bookkeeping exercise where they create the deposit and they create the debt at the same time. And reserves aren't needed for the process. And here's the most recent statement I could find on that from the European Central Bank. And even though I'm very critical of central banks, I'm finding that quite a few of the research units are almost screaming at the economic profession saying, hello, drop out of the textbooks, come to reality. This is what actually happens. This is what we do. This is in the European Central Bank bulletin from last month, saying the reserve requirements depend upon the stock of deposits as they split in the previous period, and this after the banks have extended the credit demanded by their customers. So they extend the credit first, the reserves are created to match that later. In fact, the Repayment Act ends up creating most of the reserves they need. So the new loan puts additional spending power into, power into circulation without reducing the spending power of savers. And therefore, aggregate demand exceeds demand from income alone. This is where I start getting at something which I know it isn't just neoclassical economists who don't follow this one. Quite a few of my colleagues in the non-orthodox world don't follow it yet as well. And Matthias and I have done a little mathematical proof of that. Well, if anybody asks me, I'll hit you with the mathematics and you can blame me or blame Jim, whichever you prefer on that. But it's aggregate demand is income plus the change in debt. 
And that's what's left out of conventional thinking. Now, the reason I saw this stuff, the reason I've been working in this area for so long is I discovered the work of Lyman Minsky back in the uh, late 80s. And Minsky was someone who, in the middle of the, the biggest boom in capitalism's history, the, the 1950s and 60s, set himself the question, why did the Great Depression occur? And said, you can't have a valid theory of economics unless you can explain the Great Depression. That was his orientation. Now, he was going completely against the grain of mainstream economics, and this is the sort of treatment he got from the mainstream. Remember, of course, Bernanke is seen as being an expert on the Great Depression. That's why he got the job as Federal Reserve Chairman. His, his complete discussion of Minsky in his book, Essays on the Great Depression, is that Minsky argued for the inherent instability of the system, but had to depart from the assumption of rational behavior. He says, I don't deny the possible importance of irrationality but it seems the best research strategy is to push rationality as far as it will go. That's it. That's 48 words in total on Minsky in his entire book. So he's not an expert on the Great Depression. He's an expert on explanations of the Great Depression that are consistent with neoclassical theory. And since neoclassical theory says capitalism can't have bad crises, the only thing that can cause a crisis is somebody outside the system, a government regulator, for example, the Federal Reserve. So he blamed the Federal Reserve for doing it, which is why I'm delighted to see him in the hotspot now. I get a certain amount of shard and joy to make out of seeing things like this. Now, he's finally been discovered by the neoclassicals, and Krugman and I locked horns over this particular paper of his, which he called the Fisher-Minsky coup approach to debt deflation. But the model he built assumed equilibrium. The DSG, they call them dynamic stochastic general equilibrium models. They're neither the dynamic nor general. They're stochastic and they believe in equilibrium, but they're neither, neither dynamic nor general. They're put in highfalutin terms that mean nothing. They don't have endogenous money or banks, and aggregate doesn't matter, only the distribution. All that goes completely against the vision Minsky himself had. So Minsky, when he first started devising his theory, said you can't build what I'm talking about in the neoclassical model because they leave out capital assets, they need our banks and money creation. They leave out what liabilities, financial liabilities do. They forget about uncertainty. They're all assumed away. And that's got worse, not better, since Minsky wrote those words. So he said we have to abandon neoclassical thought rather than build on it. And I was quite happy to do that. So what I did was build on Minsky's ideas. One of the key ones was disequilibrium matters. Neoclassical theory assumes the economy is always in or very near or heading towards equilibrium. But the best argument against it came from somebody who himself was an equilibrium thinker when he wrote Irving Fisher back in the 1920s and 30s. And he wrote the equilibrium theory of in interest and finance back in the 19 1907 to 1930. And then he followed his own instincts, followed his own theory, and got wiped out by the financial crash of the Great Depression. And in that state, when he was really effectively bankrupt, he then reconsidered in a great deal of pain why on earth did he get it wrong? And he realized. A major reason was because he assumed equilibrium. But he said, in the real world, even if you believe the system heads towards equilibrium, because shocks come in at all times, any variable is going to be above or below its ideal equilibrium. Therefore, to model it, you have to take disequilibrium as your starting point. It's not quite as eloquent as Keynes, but a similar idea. It's as absurd to assume that the variables in the economy will stay in put in perfect equilibrium as it is to assume the Atlantic Ocean can ever be without a wave. So you've got to be disequilibrium to begin with. And Minsky's argument goes beyond that again to say even if you reached equilibrium, that itself would be destabilizing. Because a period of tranquil growth in a capitalist economy is the exception, not the norm. And when you get that period of tranquil growth, your reaction is to have rising expectations. So constant, stable growth leads to rising expectations, which means you gamble more and you therefore destabilize the system. And he said, this is a beautiful line. The tendency to transform doing well into a speculative investment boom is the basic instability in the capitalist economy. And that, again, is a vision which transcends most of the left that tends to have a, you know, capitalism has to go into depression type attitude or under consumption is still so on, or crisis about profit of, profitability, the declining rate of profit and all that stuff. And, cardboard cutout Marxists. Um, this is seeing capitalism having a tendency to get into too much debt, and that causes its dilemmas. And endogenous money is essential because they create spending power out of nothing. Now, that's good when it finances investment or behaviour of, of 
entrepreneurs, and this is coming to, to Sean Pater, who uh, was Minsky's PhD supervisor, and in talking about how money is provided, he said the conventional argument that the saver gives to a borrower is not obviously absurd, therefore it takes a bit of thinking to realise why it is absurd. He said the other way of obtaining money is the creation of purchasing power by the banks, which is not transforming existing purchasing power, but creating new purchasing power out of nothing. Now, Sean Pater is an economist you should follow. He's truly one of the great economists. But the non-great economists actually end up confirming Sean Pater when they do empirical work. This is Spammer and French, who are two of the guilty suspects for foisting the efficient markets hypothesis upon the world. And well, they did some empirical research at one stage. They looked at the aggregate level of debt for the corporate sector, aggregate retained earnings, et cetera, et cetera, and took a close look at it and said it's obvious that changes in the aggregate level of business debt correlate with changes in investment. And they said debt's the residual variable. Investment increases debt and higher earnings tend to reduce it. So debt plays a crucial role in financing the productive investment in the capitalist economy. The bad stuff is, is where Minsky comes in, it also finances Ponzi schemes, whether the people involved in those know they're in a Ponzi scheme or not. And that's when you have asset prices being driven up by rising levels of leverage. And that's really been the story of the last 40 years uh, in American capitalism and also in Canadian and Australia, basically the whole OECD area. So Minsky's theory actually sounds like a description of reality, and that's what a theory should be, rather than a absurd load of nonsense, but I'll go through it. He talks about an economy in historical time. Now, both history and time are omitted from conventional economic theory. Since you're in historical... Whoops, I think I've somehow been disconnected there. Is that sound suddenly gone down? Yeah, it's gone down. Uh, what happened? Any... Hang on. Ah, okay, we're back again. Thank you. Okay. Uh, because in historical time there's been a debt-induced recession in the recent past, like the 1990s recession, for example, that means firms and, and banks are both conservative about the amount of debt they'll take on. Because they're conservative about what they'll consider, only conservative projects are put forward. Because the economy has recovered, most of those projects succeed. And firms start to revise their risk premiums, thinking, hey, if we'd actually been more highly levered, we would have made more money. So you get a rise in the accepted ratio of debt to equity, and off we go into the telecommunications boom and the internet bubble and so on. And assets start to be valued more highly as well. So the classic stability is destabilising, as Minsky summarised so well. A period of tranquility causes rising expectations, and for a while that's good because you actually get more investment and the investment makes the economy grow faster. But you also get to what Minsky calls the euphoric economy, when people in the finance markets in particular, start to behave as if they're living on a permanent diet of cocaine. <laughs> Quite a few of them are. <laughs> so speculation on assets rises. There's an increased willingness to lend money, and of course that causes the money supply to expand, enabling riskier investments, so there's more loss-making investments going on. You're accumulating losses in the middle of all this process, which is part of the reason why it starts to fall over. And Ponzi financiers turn out. Now, they're, they're financiers who have a cash flow on their assets, which is less than the debt servicing cost on the assets. So they're technically always insolvent. They make money by selling assets in a rising market, and they must borrow money before they make an asset sale. They've got an interest rate insensitive demand for finance, which helps push up commercial rates for everybody else. You've had failed ventures as well, accumulating losses, accumulating debt, etc., etc. Ultimately, one of those parts of those forces makes a few projects that started off being conservatively funded become speculative. Some of those investors sell their assets in. There's all sorts of triggers that could bring the whole thing undone. But the entry of new sellers into the asset markets floods the asset market. It collapses. It's nowhere near as broad as our obsession about talking about asset prices makes it seem. And as soon as that trend of rising asset prices ends, the Ponzi's a history. They're the first ones to go bankrupt because they can't sell assets for profit anymore, nor can they roll over the debt they've currently got. They're gone. My favourite example there was a guy called Christopher Scase, an Australian Ponzi merchant from the late uh, 1980s. He made a takeover bid for MGM, $3 billion. Corcoran, or Kokorian, is that his name? Yeah, Kokorian, was on the board of MGM, didn't believe this guy, investigated his finances, said, he's a con artist, don't touch him, don't go near it, G uh, uh, 
MGM turned down the takeover bid. So he had $3 billion lined up to buy it. And the next week, he went bankrupt because he couldn't pay a $12 million loan installment. Now, if he got the $3 billion, he would have bought MGM with $3.2 billion, paid the $12 million out of spare change and kept on going for a bit longer until he would have crashed MGM at some stage. So the coin did the world a service by stopping him. But that's, that's how fragile they are. They, if they don't have the, the rising debt, they can't get the debt again. They can't sell the asset at a profit there history. Asset prices collapse, debt to equity ratios plunge, the expansion of the money supply goes into reverse, investment evaporates, you're back where you started again. Now, I think you're probably all going through the mental process of filling in the historical blanks yourself as I went through that. So that's, that's the basic pattern. But on top of that, the process will, if you don't have a, a, a terminal crisis, the process tends to repeat itself before you reduce the debt back to where you started from on the previous cycle. And the logic with this is quite simple. Effectively, you're borrowing money during a boom. You have to repay it during a slump. You don't quite get the cash flows you expect to repay it right down to the bottom again. But by the time you start to be flattening out once more, you've got through the crisis and your expectations start when, with a higher level of debt, which you're now inured to by having survived the previous time. But you do finally get that final crisis where the debt level overwhelms the economy. And that's what we've done this time around. That's why you're seeing that huge plunge rather than just a cycle and a renewal of debt levels going even higher. So I built a model of Minsky working from a, a cyclical model by a guy called Richard Goodwin, who produced back in 1967. And I'll, I'll take you through some maths here. So this is the slide 23 Jim was talking about. But the basic idea that in Goodwin's model is that the, it's a deterministic model that says a certain amount of capital will determine the amount of output by a relationship economists call the accelerator. So a sort of a normal ratio that's given is three. So if you have a capital stock of 1.2 trillion, you'll have GDP of 400 billion. With the output determined, that lets you know how many workers you need to hire given labor productivity. So you divide output by labor productivity and you get how many workers you need to hire. Given your population, it tells you what your employment rate is. And a conventional thing in any economic model, even though the neoclassical has destroyed Keynesian economics by deriding the Phillips curve, is this idea that there's a nonlinear relationship between unemployment and the rate of wage changes. I'm just using a linear one here. They call the Phillips curve. That gives you the rate of change of wages. If you integrate that, this has been done numerically, you then get the wage level. Multiply that by employment, you get the wage bill. In this very simple model, there are only two social classes, workers and capitalists. Subtract wages from output, you've got profit. Again, in this very simple model, Goodman had capitalists investing all their profit. So if you invest, that's the rate of change of capital. Integrate that, you've got the capital, and you're back where you started again. And what that gives you is a model of a cyclical economy. That's the sort of stuff I teach my students in day one. Get them over the belief everything has to reach equilibrium. Yeah, most of them die of a heart attack, but that's okay. The good ones survive. Okay. Now, Goodman didn't have any role for debt in the model, but you've got to bring in debt to have Minsky. And therefore, it's essential that capitalists wish to invest more than they earn during a boom and less than a slump. And they do. That's exactly what Famer and French found. So that verbal statement there turns up as an equation like that. The rate of change of debt is going to be investment minus profits. That's looking just at corporate debt now. This is the sort of borrowing you actually want to see. But even that can lead to trouble. So... When I ran the model for the very first time, I saw two potential behaviours. On the left-hand side, depending on how close you got to the equilibrium, if you started near the equilibrium of the system, you'd see the system converging. This, that's the red line is cycles in the employment rate, the blue, blue line is cycles in wages share, and clearly the system's converging. But over here, it's doing something very different. It's exactly the same model, exactly the same parameters, just different initial conditions. This is what people in the chaos theory talk about sensitivity to initial conditions. What's going on behind those two situations is different behaviour in the aggregate level of debt. And the blue line is where debt's rising, the red line is where debt is falling. And what you see is that cyclical process that Minsky spoke about, of debt going through a series of humps until bang, it hit the mother of all humps, and it's good night, Josephine, for the economy. And that's what I read back in 1995. I had the government there as well, which could stabilise the system. What I'm trying to do now is to convert that into a strictly monetary model. That's one reason why I'm over here in Canada with uh, Matthias and friends at the uh, Fields Institute. So I've done that, and with that model, 
This is looking at the stylized data now for America. So I've taken the data for the inflation rate and the employment rate, which neoclassical economists do consider. But the black line is the one they ignore, the ratio of debt to GDP. They reckon, they reckon it's got no role at all. That's the empirical data smooth. This is what my model generates as an output. Now, I can't get the downturn in debt we're now going through, but that would include bankruptcy, which I haven't yet built into the model. But I think it is a stylized fact. I've come pretty close to getting the behavior of the system we've actually seen. And that's sitting, waiting to be published by an author in a journal, in a very, what used to be a progressive journal is now a conservative one, and I'm wondering how long the editor's really going to sit on it. I might, I might uh, work on that one, Jim, some stage in the next few uh, months. We'll see. So, let's try now to bring some. Here's the other slide Jim was warning you about. Why do I say income plus change in debt gives you aggregate demand? Well, this, think about your own spending. If you went shopping, you can either whack it on the, uh, the, the MasterCard, which is the debt, or you take your cash out of your pocket or you use your debit card. So you can either spend from your income or your change in debt. And because of endogenous money, that aggregates. The change of debt doesn't cancel out. If you go shopping now, with your credit card and you know, whack $10,000 out to go and buy some uh, you know, very good sports car or a very cheap sports car or a good motorbike. <laughs> lots, of mo lots, of, lots, of, lots of push bikes. I actually, you said it had a very expensive push bike in the sea. It's uh, rather good to see. I wish Miss Sydney was the same. But if you do that, you actually create money and debt at the same time. The banks can't stop you doing that. You could create $10,000 of traditional money and debt yourself by doing that. Of course, somebody else gets the money, you get the debt. There's also two categories of supply. You can spend that money on goods and services, or you can go and gamble on a new condo, hoping its price is going to rise. So you either buy goods and services or existing assets, financial claims on existing assets. And Schumpeter argued that income is mainly spent upon consumption, whereas the change in debt mainly finances investment. And Minsky adds in yes, but it also finances speculation. So I can make this argument saying wages plus profits plus the change in debt is going to be equal to consumption expenditure plus investment plus the new gambling on asset prices with wages and profits mainly going, distributed profits mainly going to consumption and the change of debt mainly financing investment and gambling on asset prices. And I call it the volrar schumpeter minsky law because neoclassical economists work with the Volrar's law to say that aggregate demand is aggregate supply. And so, well, while I was on the right track, but he left out credit. So Schumpeter and Minsky bring in credit. So I'm giving some, pardon the pun, credit to Volra to conclude his name there because you do need that sort of accounting balance to understand how a capitalist system works. But this is the balance I work with. And that now brings in a few little tricks which start to get very hairy. This is the slide Jim will tell you to go get your second drink for. <laughs> uh, income plus change in debt, I've now got equal to GDP plus turn net turnover in assets. And you can break down asset gambling into the price of assets times the quantity times this fraction of the turnover in a year, which is much less than 100%, of course. And that has implications for both aggregate demand and aggregate economic performance, so employment and output, uh, because the change in debt is going to have a strong relationship to GDP, but that change in debt is what gives you investment that finances growth in GDP. But debt acceleration will also drive both changes in GDP and changes in asset prices. Now I'm doing the second differential, looking at the change of income, and what now turns up is not the change of debt, but the acceleration of debt. And that acceleration of debt is going to be related to change in asset prices. I know that's hairy, but part of the way to think about it, if you have to, if you want to sustain the current price level of condos, you need a constant flow of people buying them, new mortgages coming in. If you want the prices to rise, that rate of growth of new mortgages has to be rising as well. So you need accelerating debt to drive asset prices up. And that's what's been happening for the last 20 to 30 years. And all this stuff explains both the crisis we've been through and the bust we're going through as well. And because we rely upon accelerating debt for rising asset prices, that's why you have to have a bust in an asset price bubble. It can't go on forever because nothing, not even debt, can accelerate forever. So looking at the level of debt we have now, comparing it to the Great Depression, there are reasons why we're going through a different experience this time around. This is breaking down American debt into 
business debt, finance sector and household. And you can see that business debt is lower today than it was back then. Now, what happened back in the 1930s was because it was so high and, and banks and, and, and firms themselves were in financial difficulty when the slump hit, the response of business people was to cut their prices and try to drag customers in through their door rather than their neighbour, when the neighbour was doing exactly the same thing. So the aggregate level of debt actually fell from 1930 on, but the price level and GDP fell so rapidly that the debt ratio rose. That's why the huge blowout in debt above that level. That's why I also start from the 1930 point for comparing us uh, today to then. But there's much higher household debt this time around. So the response is rather than businesses having to liquidate or have liquidation sales to avoid bankruptcy themselves, it's their customers that have been liquidated. And businesses are sitting there waiting, why is nobody coming in through the door? So you're getting slow deflation rather than the very rapid deflation of the Great Depression. But the key one is the incredible rise in finance sector debt. It was 20% of GDP at the peak of the Great Depression. It's 120% plus this time round. And that's all been used to gamble on rising asset prices. So you can explain both this crisis and the difference with the last one by focusing on the level of debt. Now, Having said that aggregate demand is income plus the change in debt, what I'm doing in these slides is I'm, in the red line I've got GDP, the blue and the black line above it are GDP plus change in debt, where the blue line is just private debt and the black line includes government debt as well. And you can see that the peak level that debt was boosting demand in the Great Depression before the slump began was about 8% of demand was being added to by changing debt, 25% fall in demand down here. The situation we're in today is far more extreme than that. The change in debt in the last big year of the boom for America was $4.5 trillion when the GDP was $14 trillion. So almost 30% of demand came from rising debt. When the slump hit, that fall in debt was $2.5 trillion. So you went from an $18.5 trillion economy down to an $11.5 trillion one in two years. That's why it was so severe. This is the sort of stuff that the post Keynesians can understand because we all follow Minsky. But the neoclassicals can't fathom why it was so bad because, look, it was only a small fall in GDP. They can't comprehend why it was so big. That's why. Nor can they comprehend why it's recovered as much as it has. This is why, because the rate of decline of debt has slowed down from the peak level during the downturn. Now, this is now looking at the acceleration of debt and change in employment. So I'm correlating that second order stuff. How much does the acceleration of debt correlate with employment change? Well, that's back in the 1930s, 20s and 30s. Now, this is a correlation coefficient that sustains itself through both boost, bust and boom, boom and bust. So often these things, you'll get a great correlation which then collapses when economic circumstances change. This one remains through bust and through boom. What about today? Working with monthly data this time round. Again, you can see the correlation. And you can see just how deep the downturn was this time around. Let's go back on that previous slide. The um, credit deceleration was far lower in the Great Depression than it was this time around. Far steeper. And you can see the recovery and then now the downturn that's happening again in America, all driven by with the ups and downs of the acceleration of credit. And that then drives what you see happening in share markets as well. This is the Dow Jones deflated by the CPI. So I simply divided this Dow Jones by the consumer price index, set the value at 100 at the beginning and gone forward 95 years. And as you can see, the, 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 there's a trend. So the black line is the trend. There, there's a good reason to have a trend for rising share prices because some companies don't pay dividends at all, Microsoft, Berkshire Hathaway and so on. And lots of companies also retain earnings and invest the earnings. But there's a reason to expect share prices to rise over time. So I've now in the next, what I've then done is deducted the actual red line, red from the from the black, and then taken a look at how much that correlates with the acceleration of debt. And that's the relationship back in the Great Depression. Pardon me, they're too fast. And this is the relationship today. So again. What we're seeing people chase on the stock market and then think that they're being stock market geniuses, they're riding the ups and downs of the acceleration of debt. Now, house prices even more so. 
This is the American house price index deflated by the CPI. Going right back to 1890, work done by Robert Schiller. It's one of the, the best of the neoclassicals now going across with the more behaviourist. Now, the average from 1980 to 1997 was 98. And no particular trend. And you can see a couple of mini bubbles there before the big one. Where I've got Greenspan on the chart, where Greenspan said the following words to Congress. A bubble does not appear likely. No, it's bleedingly obvious, you twit. <laughs> Home prices declines, were they to occur, likely would not have substantive, substantial macroeconomic implications. Why does anybody listen to this guy anymore? And why do people say if he's bad, who does he associate with? Let's not listen to them either. We need some guilt by association in this profession. But he gets away with it. And so do they. Now, the relationship between accelerating mortgage debt and house prices in America is stunningly strong. The change in real house prices, when they're going up and going down, was the acceleration and deceleration of mortgage debt. And what about Canada? You're not as bad as America, probably. Again, I'm not sure about the level of finance sector debt. This is breaking your debt down and, again, comparing it to Australia and America. So you've got a, a higher level of debt than Australia, which is not a good thing, because I reckon we're going to have a bit of fun shortly, but nothing like the level of America, so long as the financial sector debt uh, is included. But that could be different, in which case all three would be very similar to each other. And looking at your the breakup of your debt, you've got a much higher level of business debt, even than America which is intriguing. Uh, but you certainly had that explosion in mortgage debt from 20% of GDP back in 1970 to 60% now. Now, to give you some idea of the difference there, Australia went from 20% in 1990 to 90% at the same time. So you've not as exaggerated a, a bubble in mortgage debt as Australia is, but certainly you've had one. And, of course, there'll be changes in the acceleration of debt across that whole period. So what's happened there? Well, first of all, in terms of debt, Remember I had showed Americans went from plus 4.5 4, plus 4 to minus 2.5 over a two-year period? You didn't quite do it. You didn't even hit the bottom. You had a plunge in the debt contribution and a strong plunge in your GDP as well, but you didn't get to the point where the blue line cost the red. So the American went right through the floor. So the reason you didn't have a severe downturn in America is because you didn't have this deep a deleveraging experience. In fact, you're still leveraging up. So you're now your debt level is growing at the same rate as GDP. So you've avoided the consequences of deleveraging, but I don't think you'll avoid them forever. Again, even though you haven't had the total deleveraging experience, that same effect of accelerating debt to, to being a major factor in determining what happens to employment occurs with you as well. It's not as strong a negative correlation as for America. What I've done here, by the way, is I've turned unemployment upside down on the right-hand axis. So I've got unemployment being 5% up here and 15% down the bottom. And here I've got the, the acceleration in debt, just to make the visual correlation more obvious. But it's a lower correlation than America's. You're not as strongly debt dominated as the American economy is. But you've still got the relationship going there, and you're still relying upon accelerating debt to keep you having uh, unemployment lower, at lower levels in America. And here we get the unemployment correlation for, I think that is America, I actually put the wrong way around, that's showing the American data, you can see it's much more strong, much stronger impact in the American data than here, that's the wrong order, pardon me about that. Now, what about the housing bubble? Always the question I can't avoid answering these days. Well, I think, yes, you have one, but it's not as extreme as Americans or Australia's. This is indexing you back to the start of the only national price index you have, which again, Jim gave me the data for this. So setting them all to American, Australian and housing and Canadian real house prices to 100 back in 1999 when your data began. Obviously, the Americans have had a bubble on its burst. And Australia's got a bubble that has burst. It's, it's taken a while. This, this was a period where we've reboosted the bubble by a government policy I call the first home vendors boost, where they gave extra money to first home buyers so they could lever it up and give five times as much to the person they bought the house on. And that restarted the bubble here. But you guys had a bit of a downturn in the crisis first hit, and you recovered again. You're now going sideways. But my guess would be you're about to start going down. Here's looking at by city, going back to 1990, a long comparison. Uh, the, the city data actually is longer than the, the nationally aggregated data. Back to 1990, 
Again, you've got a bubble ranging somewhere between the, where the Americans have fallen to from the peak of their bubble across the same time and the maximum level that Australia's hit across your, your major cities. But the same thing as driving your house prices as drove all the others is mortgage acceleration. So this is, you can see that for, from 2000 right through to 2009, your mortgage debt was accelerating. And that's why you had your rising house prices. Then it plunged during the first beginning of the downturn. Then it recovered again. You're back accelerating. Your house prices were driven by that phenomenon. And now, as you can see, your acceleration is heading negative again. You've still got positive house prices, but I'd lay odds they're going to go that way. And I wouldn't like to be somebody selling a condo or two next year for that reason. This is looking at the longer term again, using that data for Vancouver. Again, showing the correlation is very powerful there. Even though I'm working with national data to, uh, to city data. Montreal, same sort of story. So what you, when you think, you, you think you're getting money for nothing when you buy a house and its price rises, you're actually capitalizing some of the debt that's been used to drive the house price up. That's what you're really doing. It's not money for nothing. It's money for, 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 for being a, what is called a debt contract mortgage. Now, you can't keep it up forever because for the last 42 years, your average rate of GDP growth has been lower than your average rate of debt growth. The black line is the average for GDP. The blue line is the average for debt. The red is the actual rate of change of debt over that time period. So at some stage, you've got to go through the same experience the Americans are going through of declining debt, and it'll be down for quite some time. Again, I can't say for Canada as comfortably as I can for America because you need long-term data here. Here's the long-term data again for America, ratio of debt to GDP, and what happened during the deleveraging periods. This is from the absolute peak. That was largely due to deflation. So I prefer this line here, where there was a 9% rate of decline per annum in the debt to GDP ratio from the beginning of the Great Depression to the beginning of the post-war boom, including a little episode over here in Germany you might have all heard about. <laughs> then off goes the bubble. Up you get to here. This is now extrapolating that rate of decline. Now, to get back to the level of debt you had back in 1980 would take you another 15 years, take America 15 years. So it's quite possible there could be 15 years of deleveraging ahead of us. Now, I know that sounds implausible, but imagine if I told you in 1990 that I expected Japan to go into a two-decade-long slump. You'd have thought I was mad, wouldn't you? So don't underrate it. These things can last for a hell of a long time. So we have to get out of this dilemma. We have to stop capitalism having these regular crashes into financial brick walls. And since accelerating debt is the real source of the bubble, and the real source of the crises, we have to break the nexus between accelerating debt and rising asset prices. So I've got two proposals for that. One I call Jubilee Shares. And the idea is that a share would, as it does now, last for as long as the company does, if you buy it from the company. And it could be sold up to seven times in a secondary market. That's just a biblical number. But after the seventh sale, it would last 50 years and then expire. Well, the idea being, you'd be an idiot to just borrow money to buy it after the seventh sale. Any time before that, maybe. Certainly, if you get into the market the first time around, you might borrow money if you think you're onto a sure thing. But it would cut off the attraction of gambling on the secondary market and limit the secondary market just to the price discovery you need for people to be able to get out of things like Facebook and get into good things. Let's say, for example, Tesla might be one of those but reduce the extent to which leverage drives what people do on stock markets and therefore get genuine valuation for shares rather than the levered share prices. The other one I call the PIL, and that stands for Property Income Limited Leverage because banks claim they're basing the loan they'll give you for a mortgage on your income. No, they're not. They're basing it on a bubble. And back in the 1960s and 70s, if you walked into a bank with $30,000, you could have walked out of that bank with the capacity to bid $100,000 on a house because all the bank would give you back then was a 70% loan to valuation ratio. Recently, if you walked into a bank with $30,000, you'd walk out with a million because the ratio had gone to 97%. Is it any wonder house prices rose? Now, I want to stop that happening right at the outset by saying the maximum amount that can be levied against a house by a bank should be about 10 times, just a round figure, 10 times the property income. So if a house is going to sell, or the house is earning, say, $25,000 a year in rent, 
then the maximum the bank should be able to lend against that would be a quarter of a million. And that would then mean that if, say, in the past now we're competing over a house and we both had the same income and the same savings, we'd also have the same leverage and the only way for one of us to beat the other would be to save more. So you get a negative relationship between leverage and house prices rather than the positive one that applies right now. Now, a lot of people, when they make proposals about how to reform the financial system, rely upon regulators or fine-tuning by economists, etc., etc. Does anybody believe that works after the last 40 years? Yeah. People that get fine-tuned are the regulators by the banks once they get enough power. So you've got to stop the banks accumulating that power in the first instance and not rely upon regulators. I'd far rather rely upon judges, whatever one might think about the legal system, or a damn sight harder to corrupt than... Uh, than the legislators are. So break that negative feedback between asset prices and the change in debt and reserve debt as much as we can for investment and some consumption, not for Ponzi schemes. Now, of course, that's all in the best of worlds after we've got through the crisis. We have to get through the crisis as well. And it, as I said, if we rely upon the normal mechanisms of deleveraging, we could be in this crisis for one and a half decades. That's if we're lucky because looking at what they're doing in Europe, we'll probably make two or three decades worth out of it given the mess they're making over there and the mess we're seeing in the political battle in America as well. So I call it a modern debt jubilee, but I think it's much sexier to call it quantitative easing for the public these days, given the way that Ben Bernanke's named it. And the idea would be to cancel the irresponsibly lent money without penalising savers, but there are savers in the system. So it'd be an injection of government-created money into private bank accounts, where if you were in debt, the debt was, your debt would be reduced by the amount of the injection. No choice about it. Couldn't decide to spend it on something else. Has to go to debt reduction. And therefore, the debt that that was associated with, whether it's bonds or bank debt, is necessarily paid down, which reduces the liquid assets or the, the money earning assets of the banks, but gives them extra liquid assets at the same time. So it doesn't affect their, their uh, solvency, but it does challenge their liquidity. Reduce bonds in value, that affects anybody who's been a saver who's got bonds. But of course, they've got a cash injection that they can spend out of the cash injection. So hopefully doing minimal damage to aggregate demand and having a minimal impact upon inflation or deflation as a result as well. But another essential thing is to reform education in economic research, economic education and economic research, because we have to throw out the neoclassical fantasy that played a major role in letting this happen in the first place and develop a realistic monetary economics which is the sort of thing I talk about in the book I'm about to sign for some people and talk to others. Thank you very much. <laughs>